Today, we are going to discuss uh, molecular descriptors and how they are related to chemical structure. And before I begin, I would like to uh, make a note that um, this lecture is central to the course um, for a number of reasons. We are going to discuss in this lecture and we are going to revisit some descriptors we are going to discuss today as well as uh, we are going to uh, discuss some new descriptors in the next lectures related to materials chemistry and catalysis so descriptors are central to the course for a number of reasons uh, first of all uh, we should mention i should mention that uh, we are mostly in uh, interested in solving the regression task uh, that's because uh, we need to make predictions of uh, target properties uh, by features of chemical systems uh, we are interested in. So if we need to make some predictions, we need to have some system features that are encoded in a way that can be processed uh, with, for example, scikit-learn. So how can we featureize matter? Uh, for that purpose, we need to use descriptors. Uh, some uh, due to um, the fact that uh, machine learning, uh, statistical modeling, and applied machine learning in various uh, science, fields of science intersect, uh, there are several terms uh, that are often used interchangeably. In, interchangeably. So uh, we uh, are going to use the term descriptor mostly. However, uh, sometimes I will call them features uh, with no... So due to uh, the fact that uh, in our cases, uh, this is uh, basically the same. So the main um, scheme of the, uh, the, the nature of uh, the regression task uh, in chemistry is to analyze struct molecular structure and uh, digitalize it uh, by using de uh, descriptors so we can uh, use uh, these descriptors in a machine learning model uh, to predict target properties. So uh, today we are interested in this. And uh, there are several classifications of molecular descriptors um that can be used and one of the classic ones is to um, classify is to discriminate uh descriptors by the dimensionality of the uh, molecular representation we are using so we can you uh According to this classification, now uh, we can have zero-dimensional descriptors, uh, one-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional. If you are interested in um, this classification, you can also uh, follow uh, the link and uh, read uh, the article in Wikipedia, uh, although the classification 
uh, differs a little bit. I mm, I'm hesitant to use uh, uh, the term four-dimensional descriptors for the number of reasons. However, mm, I suggest you uh, use this article as an um, extra reading material. So, <clears throat> if uh, we uh, consider zero-dimensional descriptors, this can be element or atom uh, count uh, in a given molecule. It can be molecular weight, so it's uh, a scalar quantity. Uh, we can have uh, one-dimensional descriptors, so we can um, build a vector that lists structural fragments, or we can use molecular fingerprints. Uh, we, uh, ha uh, we mentioned, uh, we have discussed molecular fingerprints uh, previously, uh, and we have discussed them briefly. So today we are going to revisit uh, some often used uh, molecular descriptors that can be computed by using RDKit, li uh, RDKit library. And <clears throat> we can uh, build, construct molecular descriptors uh, that are two-dimensional and they are mostly uh, they are mostly uh, they mostly relate to molecular graph uh, the notion we are going to discuss today um, and also we can have uh, three-dimensional descriptors in this classification so, uh, these descriptors would uh, these descriptors describe <laughs> uh, three-dimensional molecules so uh, by uh, using uh, the by um, designating this classification as uh, the classification due to dimensionality, I mean that uh, uh, in this case we describe molecules as two-dimensional objects, and in this case we describe molecules as three-dimensional objects. And we are going to see examples soon. So we can only we can uh, we can also consider uh, a little bit a, a classification that is different a little bit. Uh, so we can describe. So we can consider descriptors as mathemat uh, mathematical entities. So and can, uh, consider them as scal scholars, vectors, matrices, and tensors. And um, most of uh, these, uh, most of descriptors from this list, we are going to discuss. Um, today and uh, we will revisit this list uh, in the end. Before considering uh, molecular descriptors, I need to um, we need to mention uh, I need to mention that um, every descriptor uh, should be uh, a representative of uh, the system we are going to uh, we are interested in and for every state of matter uh, there uh, there are uh, descriptors that can or cannot be adequate and uh, if we consider uh, molecular uh, matter um, for example in the gas the gas state or in uh, the uh, in the liquid state for example solutions or if we consider molecular crystals 
then we can use molecular descriptors that treat molecules as um, fundamental objects and encode molecular structure. Uh, however, if we are interested in uh, ionic crystals or atomic crystals, um, mostly, so uh, in these cases, uh, we deal with tasks of material science of uh, often. So in these cases, we need to <coughs> digitalize uh, crystalline structure. And uh, these uh, descriptors for these uh, cases, we are going to uh, discuss a little bit later. So if we consider a molecule, or uh, if we consider a molecular matter, then we have several scales at which we can define descriptors. So we can uh, we may need to um, describe atomic features, uh, features of atoms in molecules. Uh, we can partition. Uh, we can partition molecules into submolecular fragments and uh, encode information on uh, chemical bonds, on functional groups, or, for example, ligands. We can also treat molecules as uh, ho uh, as a whole, and we can. In some cases, we need to um, include su supramolecular features uh, like intramolecular forces uh, that uh, sometimes, that quite often um, are present at nanometer scale. Uh, so in some cases, we need to include sub supramolecular features. Of course, we, uh, there is uh, the ma macroscopic scale. And uh, some machine learning tasks in chemistry um, use uh, microsco uh, microscopic system features as descriptors. And this uh, probably will be mentioned later. Uh, so let's begin by discussing at uh, atomic features or atomic descriptors. Uh, first of all, uh, we can mention atomic charges. And in uh, chemistry and related fields, uh, we can speak of formal atomic charges that uh, usually are drawn in Lewis formulae, however, they usually have no di di direct physical meaning and uh, a more <laughs> consistent way would be to use par partial atomic charges that uh, are computed um, in many different schemes. Um, the, so uh, here I provide a link to the Wikipedia article that is uh, also worth mentioning if you are new to the uh, if you feel yourself beginners uh, in the field of structural chemistry. So there is some info on uh, on some charge schemes that were developed in chemistry. And uh, in quantum chemistry, there are several schemes, uh, as for example, Malkin charges, Lovedin charges, Colson charges, etc. They can be computed uh, by, uh, by performing quantum chemical computations and analyzing orbital populations. Uh, as uh, 
because of the fact that we can not uh, cover uh, the field of quantum chemistry in our lectures, I can only give you some references. However, most of these charges can be computed automatically by quantum chemistry software, uh, including the software we are going to use in the upcoming workshop. Uh, there is also one scheme uh, in quantum, uh, a one charge scheme that differs from the previous ones uh, in the field of quantum chemistry. Uh, I should mention uh, uh, this is because of the fact that this sc charge scheme is in fact uh, a whole theory that uh, can be used to um, partition molecules into atoms. Uh, and uh, it does uh, this in a consistent and uh, I would say physically meaningful way. Uh, this uh, may seem a little bit uh, sophisticated. However, it rests on a simple principle. Every uh, molecule in the uh, Q QTAM theory, um, which uh, stands for quantum topological atoms and molecules, each molecule can be partitioned into atomic basins. Um, so every basin is enclosed in uh, the, the zero net uh, electron flux surface. So this surface encloses a region of space uh, in which uh, atom, uh, an atomic nucleus uh, is, well, usually uh, atomic nucleus is contained. And uh, in any given moment of time, uh, the amount of electron density that goes out of this atomic basin goes in. So the um, integral uh, atomic density in this basin is constant. And by integrating uh, atomic uh, density uh, in this basin, uh, by using this formula, <coughs> we can compute any property uh, that can be represented by a, a quantum chemical operator. So, for example, this can be energy, or this can be charge, or atomic density. So, uh, this uh, also can look, so this can look sophisticated. However, uh, any uh, atomic property uh, defined in this way can uh, e uh, can easily be computed uh, by using uh, that by using specific quantum chemical software, and it's uh, done automatically as well. Uh, this uh, scheme allows us to mm, have a very representative atomic properties. However, to use this scheme we need to perform um, quantum chemical calculations that require to, uh, usually require too much processor time. And in the end, I will uh, show you why um, using descriptors that are costly to calculate is impractical. So we can also partition molecules into submolecular fragments. And uh, in this case, uh, we can uh, use partition, partitioning into functional groups. So now we can revisit 
the material from the previous lecture, we can use uh, Hamid constants to um, measure uh, electronic effect of substituents. We can also use the approach of Tuft to uh, measure uh, electronic effect and uh, steric effects altogether. And also we can use sterimal descriptors if we are interested in uh, ligand effects. So uh, briefly, um, I mentioned that in the previous lecture, I mentioned that there are uh, three uh, often used sterimal numbers, L, uh, B1, that is shorter than B5. And there are uh, several libraries that allow us to calculate thermal descriptors in a convenient way. Among the libraries I can suggest you is uh, thermal by the uh, research group of Robert Payton. And you can um, you have the link here, um, so here, it, uh, it uses PIP to, uh, for installation and in, it can compute uh, thermal descriptors conveniently. Also, you can use uh, the new version of uh, this library called W thermal. Um, briefly, the advanced version of uh, the thermal library allows you allows us to compute the so-called Boltzmann weighted thermal factors. So if we consider a substituent, um, for example, if we consider a propyl substituent. So we take this part. Uh, there is ambiguity in the definition of L, B1 and B5 numbers for a simple reason. That's because uh, organic substituents uh, and aliphatic organic sub substituents as uh, the propyl group, for example, can have many co conformations. So mm, there are rotations around sigma bonds and these rotations uh, proceed very rapidly, even at standard conditions. So you have, uh, in fact, if you consider such a substituent, you have an ensemble of conformers that uh, can be observed at uh, even short times. So uh, this uh, W thermal library uses the so-called Boltzmann weighting to uh, compute uh, Boltzmann uh, to compute representative thermal numbers. The, in this scheme, um, energy of uh, conformers is computed and uh, their energies uh, are used to uh, weight uh, in such a way that uh, weight uh, thermal numbers in such a way that uh, high energy conformers um, um, have uh, low weights and uh, low uh, low energy conformers uh, contribute mostly to the L, B1, and B5 uh, descriptors. You can also use the Morpheus library. Uh, 
uh, developed by uh, TL Yorner. And uh, it uh, can be easily installed by using PIP or Conda. And you can compute uh, several properties, including uh, Tolman cone angles, we are going to discuss now. So, um, we uh, have discussed thermal numbers. However, there is another way that uh, can be used to measure steric factors of ligands or organic groups. Um, Tolman proposed uh, his uh, approach uh, in uh, 1970s. And this, uh, in this way, in this uh, formalism, uh, the cone angle uh, angle between uh, these vectors uh, that uh, go tangentially uh, tangentially to uh, ligands uh, van der Waals spheres. Uh, is representative of uh, ligands uh, steric factor. And uh, I should also mention that we can compute Tolman cone angles uh, and thermal descriptors for organic groups as well. So we can compute these quantities for uh, aliphatic uh, organic functional groups, for example. Uh, there is another classic uh, ligand parameter that is called Tolman electronic parameter. And this was uh, proposed for uh, transition metal complexes. And um, uh, it is uh, this parameter is uh, related to the uh, stretching infrared frequency uh, of uh, the um, carbon monoxide group. So a carbon monoxide ligand. Um, I've mentioned uh, infrared um, spectroscopy several lectures ago and um, Briefly, upon uh, the radiation with uh, infrared light, some molecule uh, atoms of some molecules start to uh, vibrate. Uh, these vibrations are um, caused by absorbing um, in um, quants of uh, infrared light. And um, most of many uh, atomic vibrations uh, in infrared spe spectra can be um, assigned to specific functional groups. So uh, for some bonds, you can have uh, specific um, infrared, uh, frequency, uh, infrared frequencies. So it can be... Uh, for example, C and uh, triple bonds, or CC triple bonds, or it can be uh, CO uh, double bonds, etc. Uh, double bond, etc. So um, by varying this ligand, we can uh, change the CO stretching IR frequency. Uh, this is due to uh, the electron density redistribution between uh, ligands, uh, metal, and uh, CO ligands. And by ch uh, changing uh, ligands from electron donating 
to electron withdrawing ligands, uh, we can change the CO stretching IR frequency. So there is a review in the chemical reviews journal. I suggest you read in if you are interested in uh, ligand descriptors uh, for catalysis. Uh, the, this review is um, quite specialized. Uh, however, uh, most of ligand descriptors, uh, all of ligand descriptors we discussed today are mentioned here. And um, <clears throat> also, I should mention molecular fingerprints uh, as important um, approach to digitalize a uh, molecule. Some researchers uh, separate, uh, usually use descriptors and molecular fingerprints into uh, different classes. Uh, however, um, here in this lecture, I mention um, classic molecular descriptors and molecular fingerprints together. Um, the most, uh, one of the most frequently used uh, types of uh, fingerprints are extended connectivity fingerprints that can be computed by using uh, the RDKit library. So there is a manual uh, for RDKit. I provide uh, the link here. And um, in a nutshell, these fingerprints are computed in the following way. First, we need to um, consider atoms. And uh, for each atom in a molecule um, that is encoded by using smiles, we can compute uh, a fingerprint. So this <clears throat> is a set of numbers that defines uh, atomic uh, properties. So it can be element or it can be, uh, uh, it can encode if uh, an atom is uh, a part of aromatic cycle or not. Uh, for each atom, uh, its connectivity is encoded. For each atom, uh, its um, type encoded. So it can be a carbonyl, uh, it can be a carbon atom of a carbonyl group, etc. So for each atom, we can compute a set of numbers by a predefined set of rules that uh, is encoded into, for example, RD kit. Next, uh, on the next iteration, we consider uh, atom pa pairs. So uh, in such a way, we describe um, functional groups, for example, a carbonyl group like here. Uh, so, and in this case, um, <clears throat> the set of numbers that defines each uh, atom is changed uh, accordingly to the uh, according to the predefined set of rules that uh, encodes uh, molecular. Uh, atomic connectivity. And uh, we can go further and further by including more and more numbers uh, in this set. So I also should um, mention that uh, in, yes, I also should mention that um, the number of uh, the, uh, the sets defining atoms changed, uh, change and uh, by um, 
performing uh, iterations, we um, include more and more information uh, on functional groups, on atoms, on functional groups, and uh, that are present in a given molecule. So uh, in, a, uh, uh, in the first iteration, we have uh, sets of numbers for each atom. And uh, next, we uh, add information on uh, atomic, on functional groups. And uh, then we can build, uh, we, uh, we can include more and more information. Um, there is a detailed uh, description of this uh, fingerprint scheme in the original publication. Uh, you can uh, read later. So we can also compute molecular features. Um, and among molecular features, I first should mention a uh, molecular vulnerable sur surface. Um, first, we need to discuss um, what, uh, how can we define, uh, how we can define uh, this type of molecular surface. And um, the simplest way to do that is to consider the Leonard Jones potential. Uh, also, you can follow the link for the Wikipedia article. And here, uh, we should mention that, well, we should consider two terms that describe attractive and repulsive interactions between uh, atoms and molecules. So, uh, if we uh, are in a region uh, of fairly high uh, interatomic or intermolecular separations, <clears throat> the Leonard, uh, Leonard Jones potential is attractive. So, this term is knowledgeable due to uh, um, the power to the 12th power. And uh, the repulsive term is dominant. Uh, this is due to the uh, London dispersion forces that act between any uh, molecule or atom. Uh, and these forces are due to the fact that in any given time uh, electron density distribution around uh, every molecule uh, fluctuates uh, from its um, me, uh, from its uh, mean value so there are fluctuations that uh, cause of the formation of mole uh, molecular uh, dipoles. Uh, and uh, these molecular di uh, dipoles can um, polarize uh, other molecules or atoms. And due to this uh, polarization, uh, uh, London forces. Uh, the, uh, London forces are due to this polarization of uh, instantaneous uh, dipole uh, polarized dipole interactions, and uh, the this potential is uh, attractive uh, to uh, the radius that is called that is uh, called the Van der Waals radius. 
uh, <clears throat> in this uh, at this point, the mm, we have a minimum for a simple system of two uh, atoms, and uh, if we uh, push uh, these atoms uh, together uh, even more, then uh, the Leonard-Jones potential becomes repulsive due to the repulsion of uh, atomic electron shells. <clears throat> so uh, for every atom uh, in a molecule, we can define um, van der Waals radius. And by constructing uh, van der Waals spheres that enclose atoms uh, and have this radii, radii uh, we can build uh, molecular van der Waals surfaces. And uh, here uh, you should note that uh, enclosed volumes uh, and um, van der Waals surfaces are additive. So uh, we can uh, compute uh, van der Waals surfaces of uh, methyl groups, of uh, uh, hydrogen uh, atoms connected to carbon atoms, etc. And uh, in such a way, we can uh, calculate molecular van der Waals surfaces by, uh, as sums of uh, van der Waals surf uh, as sums of uh, terms of increments of every atom or atomic group. So uh, van der Waals surfaces can be used as molecular descriptors and uh, can also be used as a basis to define uh, several other descriptors we are going to discuss. There is another way to define molecular volume and uh, this is uh, done uh, in close relation to um, experimental data on uh, that is uh, that can be on experimental data on uh, chromatography so in this work of Abraham and Magoan, uh, use uh, compute uh, atomic volumes um, by fitting uh, some equations like uh, those we uh, like the equation we discussed on the in the previous lecture. Uh, so they compute uh, capacity factors uh, determined by reverse phase liquid chromatography. And uh, these uh, capacity factors are related to molecular volume uh, due to the nature of chromatography. Here I show you a simplified uh, scheme that uh, describes the principle of column chromatography. Um, the experimental setup for uh, reverse phase liquid chromatography is um, uh, much more complex. However, uh, to understand uh, the principle, uh, this is uh, well enough. So um, <clears throat> to perform uh, chromatography, we use uh, a column with uh, an adsorbent that interacts uh, with uh, the uh, solution and uh, it it interacts uh, with uh, solutes in this solution. Um, so the 
these interactions are defined by intermolecular forces uh, like electrostatic interactions and the van der Waals interactions. <clears throat> and uh, molecular volume affects the so-called retention time. So uh, depending on the type of column uh, used, uh, molecules with higher volumes or lower volumes uh, can go through the column uh, faster or slower. And here they measured uh, uh, capacity factors that uh, show the show um, how fast a given uh, substance goes through the co column and they uh, build an equation that relates molecular volume volume so for these uh, uh, molecular volumes can be partitioned into at atomic contributions with quite uh, high accuracy and for uh, it, it it was done for several elements so we can uh, calculate molecular volumes for machine learning studies by using the McGowan scheme uh, as well as we can use uh, van, uh, van der Waals volumes <laughs> Here I also should mention that many uh, atomic and functional group, group properties are ad additive. Uh, as a simple example from uh, the field of general chemistry uh, and from the fields of general and organic chemistry, we can discuss uh, heats of uh, combustion and heats of formation of uh, uh, aliphatic hydrocarbons and um, these uh, uh, these heats uh, are additive and depend on the numbers on the number of uh, numbers of uh, different atomic groups in a given hydrocarbon so uh, these heats of uh, for example heats of formation can be computed by using this equation and this uh, relates uh, nicely to the uh, quantum theory of atoms and molecules because molecular property can uh, is uh, can be defined as a sum of atomic properties so there is a, a quantum chemical foundation to the additivity of atomic uh, and functional group um, so so there is a quantum chemical foundation for uh, this additivity however I should also mention that uh, in there is a limit to uh, this additivity and uh, this is due to the fact that <coughs> atomic groups uh, so functional groups interact with each other uh, and cause electron density redistributions uh, which causes uh, electronic density dist uh, redistributions and um, these limits of the additivity so there is uh, an error the uh, irreducible error uh, in this equation related to the fact that uh, functional groups uh, like uh, ch3 ch2 etc interact with each other <laughs> We can also define 
polar molecular surfaces into uh, parallel, I would say, ways. Uh, first of all, we can uh, compute, uh, for example, molecular van der Waal surface, or we can use any different uh, molecular surface scheme. And uh, we, uh, in this uh, surf, uh, in this molecular surface, we can identify polar item polar atoms. Uh, so after uh, define uh, after finding them, we can <clears throat> extract the surf uh, the subsurface that uh, is. Um, that encloses uh, polar atoms in a given molecule, and uh, in such a way we uh, so we sum these uh, polar uh, these surfaces of polar atoms, and in such a way we define uh, the so-called three D polar surface area. So if we are interested into um, properties of uh, polar molecules or if our target property is uh, related to uh, the polar groups in molecules we can and uh, should and sometimes should uh, use uh, 3d psa uh, this can uh, this descriptor can be representative in correlation in correlations of uh, molecular structure with uh, solubility, for example. Uh, however, there is another way uh, that uh, there, is, uh, there is another approach uh, that can be used to compute uh, polar surface area. And in this approach, uh, we uh, have no need to uh, we have no need in 3D molecular structure. Uh, this uh, gives us uh, this is good for us uh, for a simple reason because uh, modeling uh, 3D molecular structure can sometimes be costly uh, if we treat uh, data sets of uh, thousands or even millions of uh, molecules so we can uh, take uh, molecular structures that compute smiles uh, and by using uh, smiles uh, we can uh, compute the so-called topological polar surface area that is uh, additive and can be uh, so uh, that uh, is computed in the following way. So we partition uh, a molecule into functional groups, and for every functional group, uh, we can uh, compute, we can define an increment or uh, an increment uh, into the molecular surface area. And uh, after statistical analysis of a large data set of organic molecules, the authors of this article uh, came to a conclusion that you can compute uh, you can only need to know uh, the type of functional group and uh, the type of functional group to define its uh, topological polar surface area. Uh, so uh, by summing up increments of functional groups, uh, you can compute this quantity without knowing the three-dimensional structure. Another uh, important uh, descriptor 
important molecular descriptor uh, that uh, is basically a microscopic feature is on the so-called log P. So basically, it's on the uh, it shows uh, solubility of uh, it compares solubility in uh, of a substance a substance in in octanol and water. So it's uh, if we uh, have a system of these two solvents, uh, we can <clears throat> you uh, we can solvate uh, a given substance in one of uh, the solvents and uh, uh, in both both solvents and after some time uh, the uh, the this substance uh, will uh, be distributed uh, between two solvents uh, so we can compute uh, concentrations uh, and calculate uh, log p. So if uh, the concentration uh, in octanol is low, uh, the substance is uh, polar. Uh, that's because uh, polar substances uh, um, are solvable, so uh, can be saluted uh, best in uh, polar substances can be uh, uh, saluted, uh, saluted best in uh, polar solvents. So this uh, descriptor is representative of, uh, of molecular polarity as well as uh, the 3D PSA and topo PSA descriptors. And here I also need to mention molecular orbitals as descriptors. And um, briefly, uh, for every molecule, you can use the LCAO approximation, LCAO formalism, uh, to um, build uh, molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals, as I've mentioned in previous lectures. So by knowing, by modeling molecular orbitals uh, using uh, quantum chemical software, we can uh, have some uh, representative descriptors that can be used in uh, machine learning studies. Uh, for those of you who are interested into um, easy and uh, in easy um, in easy introduction into molecular orbital theory, I would suggest uh, this textbook. Um, I should mention that in this text uh, this textbook is for uh, inorganic chemists, uh, inorganic, uh, for students that study inorganic chemistry. And um, it omits many uh, mathematical foundations and uses uh, and describes uh, molecular orbital uh, theory on the qualitative, qualitative level. So this can be an easy introduction. And uh, among molecular orbitals, there are two that are most representative for a number of reasons. So, uh, first of all, we, so we should mention uh, the lower unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO, and um, <clears throat> Uh, higher uh, unoccupied, uh, higher occupied molecular orbital, OMO. Um, um, these uh, molecular orbitals are often 
uh, often describe uh, molecular reactivity, and you can follow the link for some info on this. So, yeah. Um, molecular orbital th theory uh, is the foundation for, uh, for several uh, quantum chemical models. So, uh, for example, in the dr chart duncanson model, uh, metal ligand bonding is uh, described uh, by the interaction of uh, p orbitals of uh, ethylene or any uh, hydrocarbon that has uh, p orbital p uh, molecular orbitals with atomic orbitals of uh, transition metal atom or ion. So these are D orbitals. <clears throat> By knowing um, energies of um, higher occupied molecular orbital and lower unoccupied molecular orbital, we can compute uh, several important descriptors by, uh, for example, by using the Kuhlman's uh, theorem, uh, we can have an estimation of uh, the molecular ionization potential. And this is uh, a very rough estimation due to the mathematical formalism underlying the Kuhlman's theorem. However, uh, for some uh, machine learning studies, it's well enough. And um, so ionization potential is basically the minimum energy uh, required to uh, remove uh, this loosely bound electron. And uh, it uh, um, is representative of it, uh, it can be representative in uh, the case, uh, in some cases uh, related to molecular reactivity. Um, next, uh, we can compute uh, homo luma gaps, and uh, these are uh, so homo luma gap. Uh, sometimes correlates with molecular reactivity as well. And we can compute the so-called uh, chemical or absolute hardness, which uh, is defined by this formula. So here uh, we have uh, ionization potential, and here we have uh, uh, the molecular electron affinity. And <clears throat> Electron affinity is the energy that is released uh, when uh, an electron attach, attaches to a given molecule to form an anion. So by computing uh, absolute hardness, uh, we can... Um, estimate molecular reactivity as well. And this is due, so it can be related to the so-called uh, uh, HSAB theory. So it's uh, Pearson's theory of heart and soft Lewis <coughs> uh, acids and bases. So this theory states that uh, the so-called hard ex uh, acids uh, react preferentially with hard bases and vice versa. So let's uh, discuss uh, this a little bit um, in a uh, little bit more detail. So I here provide you uh, the link to this article and uh, <clears throat> So how can we define uh, uh, hard uh, acids 
and bases. They usually have small atomic radii, uh, high oxidation states, and low polarizability. Uh, so uh, they, their electrons are tightly bound to uh, the uh, atoms. And uh, on the contrary, um, in soft uh, acids and bases that have large atomic radi uh, radii, uh, atomic, uh, so electron shells uh, are, outer electron shells uh, can be diffused uh, so soft acids and bases have high polarizability, uh, so large atomic radii, and uh, um, in um, outer electrons, uh, if we simplify a little bit, are uh, loosely bound. So usually uh, hard acids and bases have uh, high electronegativity and uh, homo lumo energies uh, are related to a uh, representative here as well. So uh, the difference in the type of bonding that uh, hard and soft acids and bases uh, participate into ionic versus covalent bonding. So uh, to uh, compare, for uh, we, for example, have uh, soft uh, acids like uh, gold uh, cation uh, as compared to uh, alkali metal cations. And uh, we can also compare um, alkoxides and uh, theolate uh, uh, anions uh, while the former is uh, the hard base, the latter is the soft base. We should also mention and uh, we should also discuss <coughs> uh, molecular dipole moments. Uh, so even um, an electronegative molecule uh, can interact electrostatically with uh, the medium or uh, with other molecules due to uh, dipole dipole interactions. And uh, also, if we consider the interaction with the medium, um, molecular dipoles. Uh, dipolar molecules interact uh, with uh, the field by uh, orienting acco uh, according to the field applied. So, in this way. So, um, we can define molecular or bone dipole moments by using this formula and <laughs> here we have uh, atomic charges and here we have uh, vectors showing uh, the positions of uh, the atoms in a given molecule. However, uh, molecules uh, that have small or zero dipole moments can also interact electrostatically due to the quadrupole quadrupole interactions. Consider um, a benzene molecule, for example. Here we have uh, uh, hydrogens that uh, have uh, small positive par partial charges. And here we have two uh, regions in which uh, benzene p orbitals are located. And uh, in such a way, 
uh, hydrogen atoms uh, that have small uh, partial positive charge can interact with um, regions of uh, high p electron density uh, by and uh, due to these two these two exemplary uh, dimeric uh, two exam uh, two exemplary dimers can be formed. So all these we can um, given uh, we can uh, formulate uh, as uh, by using the following formula. Uh, so if we want to uh, compute uh, electrostatic potential of a charge system in a point with a radius vector r, uh, we can use this formula, or uh, we can uh, use the so-called mul multiple expansion uh, that mm, allows us to uh, compute uh, on the potential um, in an approximated way. So um, the uh, derivation of this formula is uh, performed by using the Taylor expansion and um, um, the, uh, the terms in this um, sum uh, are usually decreasing well, at least in most um, chemical irrelevant syst uh, systems. And uh, here we have uh, a total charge of uh, a multiple system. Here we have the molecular dipole vector, and this is uh, the unit vector. Uh, and here we have the so-called uh, quadrupole matrix. Uh, and take uh, we can uh, take a four, uh, four uh, particle system in which uh, four these four particles are charged. So this uh, four charge system can be treated as a quadrupole. Even in uh, e even in the case uh, uh, when this uh, when the total charge is zero, uh, this charge system can interact uh, with uh, can interact electrostatically with uh, the medium or another molecules. We should also mention molecular graphs. Uh, that are the foundation of uh, many representative descriptors. So if we have uh, uh, so pin, uh, pentane, mo uh, pentane molecules, uh, we uh, can draw uh, a molecular graphs like, like this. Uh, we can also draw a molecular graph uh, like this, uh, the graph is uh, representative of uh, cyclopentane, and uh, we can also uh, we should also mention that <clears throat> uh, simple molecular graphs usually omit information on chemical bonding and uh, elemental composition. So these are these two are equivalent. However, we can use uh, to to make uh, a molecular graph more representative. <coughs> we can use uh, a weighted graph instead. So uh, we can uh, associate um, features uh, with. Uh, every vertex, uh, uh, vertex, and um, a weighted graph, a main code, uh, a lot of uh, molecular features 
and it can encode uh, even uh, structure of complex uh, molecules like enantiomers or molecules that cannot be representative uh, cannot be represented with Lewis structures. Um, the use of uh, graph neural networks uh, and weighted graphs, e graphs is a hot new topic in chemistry. So uh, there are some uh, articles uh, you can find elsewhere on this uh, new uh, topic in computational chemistry. So um, for every molecular graph, we can uh, build two matrices. Uh, first, we can define a uh, connectivity matrix like this. <coughs> it shows uh, which uh, atoms are interconnected, uh, uh, bonded by chemical bonds. So for example, here in the case of cyclopentane molecule, um, the first atom is uh, bound to the second and the fifth, uh, uh, fifth atoms. Um, and in we can also define uh, a distance matrix for <coughs> every molecular graph. Uh, we, uh, such, a graph uh, such a matrix shows us uh, the number of bones we need to follow <coughs> to uh, the number of bones that connect uh, to uh, given atoms. For example, the uh, first and the fifth, fifth uh, atoms are connected by four CC bonds in the uh, uh, pentane molecule. And uh, in such a way, uh, so having uh, connectivity and distance matrices we can define uh, the so-called topological indices, uh, which are invariants of a molecular graph uh, formulated to represent uh, features of interest. So <laughs> we uh, these are basically functions that are computed on uh, matrix uh, matrices. Uh, and give us uh, some numbers. Um, here I would like to uh, mention two, uh, the Belobin index and uh, the Birds index. Uh, I've sent you uh, the, these uh, papers I mentioned. Uh, I give refer uh, references, uh, references to and for example, in uh, the paper of Belabon, um, they use uh, connectivity matrices uh, to compute uh, the so-called uh, connectivity sums. Um, so they sum up um, uh, information on uh, information that is contained in connectivity matrices, and they also uh, define the so-called uh, cyclomatic number to account for um, cycles in molecular graphs. In the paper by Birds, uh, they take uh, the authors uh, take uh, a different approach. So while here uh, <clears throat> we uh, 
encode information on uh, molecular connectivity. Here, uh, information on molecular complexity is encoded. So how can we uh, broadly define molecular complexity? By the presence of different uh, bonds and uh, heteroatoms in a molecule. So in the Burtz's approach, uh, molecule, molecular graphs is defined by uh, in the following way. So the formula uh, for uh, in the final formula, uh, the number of connections is included. So um, the uh, author is also includes uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, different elements, uh, number of atoms of different elements into the uh, description. And uh, there are uh, schemes to illustrate the formalism uh, in the paper, in the original paper. And the uh, last descriptor we are going to discuss today is uh, the Coulomb matrix. Uh, it is defined uh, by uh, this formula. So for uh, we uh, take a 3D structure of a molecule and we compute uh, these uh, th uh, two types of terms. Uh, first of all, for diagonal terms, uh, we use this formula uh, in which uh, uh, Zi is uh, the uh, nu uh, nucleus charge of the ETH atom. So these are uh, diagonal terms. Uh, that are computed this way. And um, for non-diagonal terms, this formula is used. And uh, basically these two are uh, nuclei charges and this uh, is uh, the interatomic distance. So uh, this descriptor can be computed uh, very easily. Uh, and so it requires uh, minimal Process uh, CPU time. And here we have uh, non diagonal terms here and here. Mm. Uh, you can uh, read uh, the referenced uh, article uh, to uh, have an original formulation. And uh, this uh, descriptor is very efficient in fact, and can be used to um, compute many molecular properties as uh, molecular energies or uh, NMR chemical shifts, uh, ionization, energy, uh, ionization energies, etc. And um, there, are, there is some criticism of this approach. So, uh, Coulomb matrices uh, should not be used as a sole descriptor of molecules that have uh, 3D isomers or distorted molecules for a number of reasons. Uh, so we are going to discuss this descriptor in more detail in the upcoming workshops and we will use uh, this descriptor. Uh, so we will use uh, why it is so efficient and about the criticism um, um, and the criticism is following. Consider uh, an acet acetylene molecule in which we, the, uh, and we uh, distort this molecule by uh, moving hydrogen atoms. Uh, so if we move uh, hydrogen atoms, uh, we 
don't change uh, the Coulomb matrix. However, uh, we can obviously expect the change in molecular energy that is associated with such a distortion. So basically, uh, some compl uh, some cases when we there are some cases uh, in which uh, Coulomb matrices uh, de uh, describe molecules uh, non uniquely. So we can have uh, same Coulomb matrices for different molecules. Uh, and this is true for uh, some molecular, some 3D isomers as well. Um, so the authors of the original paper reply to this criticism. You can follow the re uh, uh, follow the reference. And uh, in summary. Uh, uh, I would like to show you the list of uh, descriptors uh, we have discussed today. So we have discussed uh, scalar descriptors, vector descriptors, <coughs> matrix descriptors. And we can also uh, speak of tensor descriptors like octopole moment if we continue the multiple expansion uh, So, um, we should also discuss uh, several features that describe uh, a good descriptor. So, the first one is uh, a good descriptor must be simpler to obtain than the target property. And uh, this is for a simple reason, because by using, by building uh, a machine learning model, uh, we uh, want to predict this target property uh, in a, a to predict it rapidly. And uh, if uh, we spend the same time that uh, we would spend to uh, compute or uh, find uh, the, the value of this target pro property, why use machine learning? So obviously, a good descriptor must be simpler to obtain than the target property. And also it should have uh, as low di dimensionality as possible. And I will uh, clarify on this on the next slide. So ideally descriptors should be uncorrelated. Uh, that's simply because in uh, the accuracy of the model uh, degrades uh, if we uh, have uh, some unwanted correlations. And uh, we can also consider the, the so-called atomistic machine learning. So if we use uh, uh, atomistic descriptors, if we, uh, if by using these descriptors, we uh, define uh, atomic structure of a given molecule, like with Coulomb matrices, uh, there are <coughs> also several terms that uh, should be applied. So um, uh, the, an ideal, a good descriptor should be invariant with two spatial translations and rotations uh, permutations of atom atomic indices. Indeed, we if we change uh, uh, the uh, atomic numbers, uh, descriptors should not change. 
and it also should be unique. Uh, so um, every uh, molecule, every isomer, and every distorted structure ideally should uh, have different descriptor. Um, Um, descriptive value and uh, for atomistic ml uh, descriptors uh, should be continuous uh, like uh, for example if we distort molecular structure descriptive value uh, or values uh, should change continuously uh, and in such a way we can differentiate descriptors uh, it can be beneficial for several in several cases uh, I uh, will mention uh, later. Uh, so descriptor should be compact and computationally cheap, of course.